We've got a, a special guest today who's a, an, I'll say old friend of mine, although he's not that old. Um, but he was the recording engineer on the, the first, like, just sideman session musician recording session I did here in town. Um, Chris has owned a couple of different recording studios and uh, worked on, I'm sure, some records that you know. And, uh, and he also farms mangrove trees. <laughs> <laughs> and we might talk about all of those things. Please welcome Chris Finney. <laughs> all right, Chris. You, so you grew up in New Orleans, right? Born and raised. What, what neighborhood? Where'd you go to high school? I went to Romo. I'm a, I, my folks did the Metairie thing after uh, they started proliferating Finneys throughout the universe. So, so you're a kid at Rummel, and you like music, and you, you got a hand for things electrical. How do you turn that into, I have a career making records for Dr. John? <laughs> Okay, so um, the, the the interesting story is uh, we yeah, had a, we, please the interesting. You know, just, the I'll truth the, is only I'll partially the valuable. Good stuff, right. Give us the interesting uh, stories. The, um, the the we had a band. Our first band was Eighty Proof because it was a big deal to be affiliated with anything alcoholic in New Orleans in the early '90s and late '80s. And uh, so we would play Jimmy's, and um, we were a tight little unit. You know, rock. We a lot of Van Halen covers. You know, that's Metairie we're talking about, and so. Um, at the end of the night, we had probably, you know, 100 people in the club, and we were charging $2 a head. And at the end of the night, Jimmy goes to pay us, and I was the designee to go get paid, so I went back there, and, and uh, he gives me a $20 bill to split between four guys. And I said, man, I know we had more people than this. He says, oh, yeah, yeah. We had, uh, you had, two, you had 100, 100 people exactly, but I have to pay the sound guy 125 bucks, and I have to pay the bartender 60 no matter what. If you guys don't draw anything, I still have to pay these guys. I said, man, this sounds like a move. It sounds like he's maneuvering me, you know? So I took the 20, gave it to the band, and went and talked to Mel, the sound guy. And I said, hey, man, Jimmy says. Oh, was Mel the sound guy? Hey, remember oh, Mel that's Wally? funny. Yeah, 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 yeah I know Mel. Hey, Baba. Yeah, so yeah. he's a crusty old dude. But uh, I, said, uh, I said, hey, Mel, is it true that you um, get 100 and 20 bucks, 150 bucks or whatever every night, whether anybody shows up or not. Yeah, that's true, Baba, you got it. Yeah. I said, man, would you teach me how to do sound? <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be a little bit more lucrative, but it was one of those natural marriages of, I've been a musician since I was five or six, uh, started on piano and guitar, and then when I got to high school, my dad kind of was noticing that there was a lot of guitar players, and he said, hey, did you ever think about bass? And it was like, aha. And so that's kind of, the, I still, to this day, feel like of all the instruments, bass is the language I speak. Piano is like learning Latin. Yeah. You know, you can kind of inform any other language that way, but, um, but bass is the one that I feel like I can actually speak. And so it was, a, it was just, a, you know, doing gigs, you'd still end up, like we were saying backstage, you're playing your gig and you go tweak the soundboard, or, you know, you start making extra money by dragging sound equipment out to other people's gigs, and one thing leads to another, and you just find you have a talent for it, and you find one part of it makes you a lot happier than another, and it's these little microscopic rewards that you can't really predict. Yeah, these decisions yeah. that you don't realize are going to affect a lot more than what you're doing next weekend. That's so true. was Mel the one who, who first taught you what? Yeah, between Mel and a guy named Greg Troyer. I don't know if you remember that name, but he had a, a studio out in Metairie called Side One Studios. And we did a lot of rap and gospel and stuff like that. And Greg was more of an entrepreneur than a musician or an engineer. And so he, um, I, my first job for him was organizing the porno magazines in his bathroom. It was like, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. It was like it was one if of these. If you're doing rap records, you know you gotta you gotta have Chinese food menus. You gotta have, no, sorry, I'm okay. And osium. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, but yeah. So it was it, it was just the opportunity of being in the control room. You do whatever it took to get in there. And so that connected me with Mike Napolitano and Trina Shoemaker and Score and Let Zippers and stuff like that. And so the road was kind of laying itself out in front of me in spite of all the rap and gospel that I had to tolerate. So early on, what was your balance of, say, live sound to studio work? Early on, it was a lot, it was, it was a lot more live sound because that's, they'll pay you to do live sound no matter how good you are. I don't know if you guys have noticed this yet, but they will pay you to do live sound no matter how good you are. Studio guys, you kind of have to be <laughs> this tall to ride this ride. Yeah, right. But, uh, the, um, I did a lot of live stuff, and then um, I started going on the road with, with bands. I dropped out of college. I started at UNO, I don't know, 91, 92, and then um, just kind of decided I was too cool for school and um, 
dropped out and I was doing guitar tech stuff for John Thomas Griffith and Paul Sanchez. And they said, hey, why don't you come on the road and do sound for us? Because Mike Mayhew was retiring. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went out on the road with Cowboy Mouth and uh, did that for about two years. I was, there was many clubs where I wasn't old enough to be in the club because I didn't realize outside of Louisiana you had to be older than 18 to drink. And, or um, 16 or whatever you know, it was. Yeah, it was about, yeah. And uh, to find out, you know, in places like Miami, you couldn't even be in the club unless you were 21 started to become an issue, you know? And then... Um, I've, I never thought you'd need a fake ID just to go to work. <laughs> just to get to... Fake visa, maybe, but... So the... Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. No fake visas. But uh, uh, the, the, we used to have this deal with Hootie and the Blowfish where we would open for them in North Carolina and they would open for us at Tipitina's. And so their star was rising. I, I take it this was before Hootie and the Blowfish was... This was before Hootie, Hootie and the Blowfish, Blowfish was a thing, yeah. And, um, and so uh, they offered me a job doing monitors because they were starting to build out their crew. And uh, so I went on the road with them. I, I left the mouth and went, went, went on the road with those guys. And that led to a few jobs where I was touring Olita Adams. And because I was always, I'm always into jazz. So the rock and roll thing is only going to satisfy me so much. Um, but Olita Adams was a really rewarding experience. And that was the first chance I had to get an actual visa to go to another country to work. And so that was a, a, a good path. And then on top of that, the money was just getting better and better. But um, I was living hard, you know, it was, it was, it's a hard life being on the road. And you yeah. really kind of have to have a mindset that will prepare you for it physically as well as mentally. And um, just about then, 20 years ago, uh, House of Blues was opening up. And my old pal Chopper Brady was the big boss applesauce over there. And so he said, hey, you want to get off the road? I'll give you a gig. And so I, I started working at House of Blues the day their grand opening. They had their soft opening in December, January of 93, 94. And I started in May of 94 at House of Blues. And I was there until 2002. Gatemouth Brown's 80th birthday was the last show I worked at House of Blues. So really, until 2002, wow. it was... Was that the one where they had the, the choppers upstairs, the motorcycles? I played a show with Gate there. I, I played one show in my life with Gate Mouth Brown. And I think was it was it. that show. That was it. That's funny. Yep. So that was your last show. And that was, yeah. And that was about the same time I stopped doing live sound. And I was, you know, I was kind of a... I don't know. I, I wasn't really full on myself so much as just determined to not have to do live sound anymore. And so rather than telling everybody I quit, I just raised my rates to an, a ridiculous number. And so it was like, if you call, if you would pay $500 a show or something, yeah, I'll come do sound. But it right. kept the phone from ringing. And that gave me a <laughs> lot more time to, gave me a lot more time to put into the studio. And that was, I had started uh, Magazine Sound where we met was um, I opened that with my buddies in 96, end of 96. Okay, so that, that actually gives me a good chance to, to play our mystery track here. Oh, no. This is, a, this is a, a track from that first session that we did at Magazine Sound, which was the first studio that you owned. Let me see. He ain't gonna be asleep none tonight. Oh, Herman. <laughs> That, this is the record that that's from. And this record is so old that I couldn't find a not pixelated image of the cover <laughs> on the internet. Um, this, was, this was Tracy Griffin's <clears throat> record. Uh, so this was, d describe the studio at Magazine Sound. Was it, was it behind like a flower shop or yeah, something? It was, oh, now it's been, it's been a ton of things since then. It was like Poochie's Palace, dog daycare and stuff like that. But it was a uh, magazine in Delachey. And it was my, my buddy George and, and our partner uh, each, you know, when you build a studio, everybody brings something to the table. One guy has money, one guy might have a piece of real estate, one, might, one guy might have a pile of equipment. And so, um, somewhere in there, we forgot to have a guy who knew what he was doing, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's how it happens. But uh, um, George's contribution was that his family, uh, his grandfather invented the snowball machine. George Ortolano Sr. or whatever. And so they had this building, and we actually, our building was 
our studio was where the snowball machine was invented in the 20s or whatever. And so um, the building was empty and they were trying to rent it. And George and I, we had bands in high school and stuff like that. And uh, so we started Fantasy. We had both worked for Greg, Greg Troyer and it was like, man, if we just did all the things that Greg did, just one better. We used to joke a thousand things under a dollar that don't yep. cost a thousand dollars and that make your place more than a thousand dollars better. Well, let's do that. Things like light switch covers. When you're in the process of making records, you don't really worry about the details of the room you're in often. And so that's what this was, was our chance to just get in there and start doing it. And so we pooled our money. And I, I, like I said, I was working at House of Blues. So uh, I was 20, I see 96. I would have been 23 or 24. And so um, I was making pretty good bread at House of Blues. And so it was expendable income. So I started buying microphones and preamps and stuff like that. And um, we bought a, an old uh, Studer tape machine. We had an A80 Mark I. Right, that, I remember on those <laughs> sessions, now if you, you know, if you play the lick for the chorus right one time, Chris just copies and pastes well, it onto, other, or, or whoever. If the um, producer but we had, you know, if, if the chorus played 12 times on the way out of the tune, you had to hit that you lick 12 times. You had to blow every times. one of them, that's yeah. exactly right. Um, yeah, so that was the tape machine. I remember there was a very cool sounding organ there, which I recall being like Davis couple, Rogan's organ. Yeah, Davis or Rogan lived. Davis's organ lived there for a long time. Um, Mark Adams had a couple of pieces of equipment there. We had this cool old Farfisa organ and a Vox Continental. And you know, I, I didn't know how cool all those things were until they start showing up on eBay ten years later for tens of thousands of dollars. I was like, damn, I threw one of those away. You know? <laughs> I let that get destroyed by, you know. So, so, so you had Magazine Sound, how long, how long were you there? We did that from 96 until 2001. And uh, I think the, the, the as you could describe it as the nail in the coffin or you could just use it as the marker where we just didn't survive past the, uh, the, the advent of Pro Tools. Once Pro Tools was kind of somewhat available. I mean, we spent $70,000 on the tape machine. And so to come up with another 20 or 30 for Pro Tools was ridiculous. It was like, no, we're going to stick to the old school analog and computers are a fad. It's not going to really catch on. And so we didn't knuckle down and, and buy the Pro Tools. And then in May of 2001, we would get a lot of clients who would come in with five, six, ten thousand dollars $10,000 and we'd give them two or three weeks and their record would be finished in three weeks. Yeah. And that same $10,000 in 2001 would buy you a Macintosh G4, a Digi 001 Pro Tool system, and a decent microphone. And so now a percentage of people who would have otherwise paid us to make their record are now buying this equipment and making their own record in their garage, which we all know has become the future. But back then it was, you, honestly, you couldn't, you couldn't predict either way if this was gonna catch on or not. Digital was still kind of in its infancy as far as something that everybody was going to use professionally. And um, some of the sound that you were getting out of it was not great, you know. Right. And, uh, and so that's, we were always after the sound. We were kind of purists and artists and not really entrepreneurs, you know. So I'm, I'm actually I'm going to skip ahead on a tune here. But we had a, so some of your workflow, you've done big budget records where you oh, get sure. to bring all the cool guys into the studio and hang out and do that. But we've worked together on some things that were much more piecemeal. I'm gonna play something from a, a George Porter record that we worked on together. Um, My man. And this was, I think George recorded a bunch of these rhythm section tracks at his house. Mm -hmm. And we put the horns on at the music shed. Um, some of you might remember, actually I have to warn you, if you've had my classes, I tell a lot of stories that I stole from Chris. <laughs> so you might hear some of these again today. Um, but we're talking about, this isn't the track that I'm gonna play, but we were uh, talking about the sample rate. We were doing the um, out in the country tune. And George says the tune's in C and we all start playing and the tune is like not in C. And, we're all, and George says, I know it's in C. And we're like, no, it's kind of in B, it's kind of, and at some point it hit me, I said, what's this, George, what's the sample rate on the session? And then you hear Chris on the headphones, hey, hold on a second. <laughs> and then you hear some like click, 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 click. And then he says, yeah, okay. And then all of a sudden it was in C again. So, <laughs> so I guess George had done the sessions 88.2, but everything else was 96 it or was, something. No, it was, it was, I don't think he was working. I think he was still on DA88s 
And even when he was going to Pro Tools, he was still using the DAA8s as the front end. So it was either 44 or 48. Right. And um, we had, you know, we had a more sophisticated system with a master clock and stuff like that. And so what had happened was he had put the session was set at 48, but the clocks that he used were set at 44. Set at 44, right. And so if you've ever made that mistake, you know the only way to undo that problem is to recreate the mistake backwards. So all I had to do was go and trick the computer into mismatching sample rates again. Right which made for a bigger nightmare down the road, but it didn't stop the session. Right, <laughs> and, and that's about a half step, the difference between four. Give it, give it anyway, here's a, here's a track from, from that session. Kick it. All I do every day is work. Got no time to play. I Did you mix work. this? Yep, all right. It's time for me to take a break. Take a break. I'm getting tired, for heaven's sake. All I do every day. I feel bad stopping it, but I'm. I'm <laughs> um, so. Can you talk a little bit about the, the challenges of, of working with stuff that's sort of piecemealed together between garages and home studios and real studios and when you get to have to mix that at the end of the day? Well, there's probably two, two things that I would say in this forum are probably worth mentioning. One is that when you record it at home and the benefit to recording at home, so it's not a bad thing. It's just that you tend to create a lot more data, a lot more information you can have, uh, you can really have a lot of choices to make after the fact. Whereas a, a professional producer or engineer in the context of a professional studio tends to commit a little bit more to a sound or to a performance. And so what you're left with on the multi-track is, uh, is pretty, pretty concise. It's pretty right. much what you want to be hearing. Whereas somebody like the maestro George Porter will record for days and days and days and days just mortgaging these decisions for the future. And just constantly, oh, I'll decide on that later, pending all these other decisions. Right. And so well, by the time it gets to, to the mixer, you're, you're stuck with some number of unmade decisions. And so the biggest responsibility that you have when you're mixing some bunch of tracks that come from a home studio is kind of whittling through the, the good stuff uh, and the bad stuff and just final, finding what's the hottest stuff. And the, the benefit to that is that you tend to be somewhat removed from the process. So you're not a part of each of these decisions as they were, you know, right. being You can just listen to it and say, this you one sounds going, this good. This is great, this sucks. And you just move forward and that's, it's, that helps. And so that becomes a, a benefit to bringing it to somebody who's a right. professional mixer. Or something. So how much do you try to insert your taste when someone simply hired you to, so if, if I hire you to mix my record, how much do you feel it's your responsibility to tell me what's good versus your responsibility to just deal with what I've given you? That's a tricky line to walk, but the bottom line is a producer and an engineer is 100% a collaborator with the artist. And I think the best resource you have as a producer is a good idea. That doesn't mean you have to put it to the forefront all the time. It doesn't mean you have to force it out there. You sit on it and have it in your pocket so that when the artist comes to you and says, I don't know what to do here, this or this, and if neither of those is a good idea, you're not having to help them make a, an equally poor decision. You can say, both of those are okay ideas, but what about this idea? The opposite is not so appealing where you say, you know, do it this way, do it this way, do it this right. way, because then it tends to be your record and it's not my name on the it's not my name on the front of the record, you right. know. Chris Finney presents Jeff Albert. Yeah, it's, it's, it does say <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Porter on so there. Yeah. The bottom line comes down to uh, satisfying what the artist wants, but that's a tricky thing too because a lot of times you have to translate English to English. So it's like, what do you actually want here? What do you, you know? They may not tell you that. They may tell you, oh, everything's great, and then you overhear through the talkback, or they don't think the mics are open, and you hear the trombone player say, oh, this is terrible. I'm, I can't hear myself, or you know, whatever. And so you you have to kind of weed through these um, bits of information all the time to really determine what it is the 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 artist wants. Keith Keller taught me that. He was a great. God rest him, he was a great psychologist. 
and you know the singer would come in and say, oh, I'm not going to sing very good today. And Keith's thing was determining, is this the mother in her looking out for the daughter who is the singer? Or is this the daughter who's the singer and is scared and needing someone to mother her? Or whatever the, yeah. whatever the psychology of it is, you have to be a step ahead of the game and kind of anticipate that. And so um, I think that's a, that's a big part of it, too, is you, uh, I joke about samurai all the time, but, you know, those dudes were hard to sneak up on. And so I feel the same way, you, should, you know. You, you know, as be, the engineer, you must be hard to sneak you must up be, on. You always yeah. have to be the coolest dude in the room, for sure. You know, a place could be falling down, meteors are crashing down around you, and you'd be like, it's okay, one more take, and we'll have this. You have to be cool, you know. Pro Tools could be spitting fire out of it, and you've got to figure out a way to keep it going, you know. Yeah, yeah well, because we, we performers can be a, a bit diva-ish if we get insulted well, but it, it's, in the middle. If, if, if you're serving the song, if you're serving the music, and that's ultimately what a diva is doing, ideally, right. you know, is, is that um, you... you if the music is right and something is not right, if something's in the way of the music being right, then you've got to help remove that obstacle. You've got to find a way to, to, to help them connect with what it is that is right. So if somebody's being a diva, well, maybe it means I have to listen harder. Or I have to work a little harder, you know? Right. Do you, I went to a conference uh, last summer and somebody presented a paper on, it was, the conference was about audio education. And uh, they had, done this survey of all of these studio owners, like, okay, we're turning out all these engineers, and what are, uh, what are the things that they need to learn? And the sort of resounding response was, well, they all know how the compressors work, and, uh, you know, they all have cool tricks for bussing their reverbs, and none of them know how to talk to clients, how to deal with artists. Like, communication was, was the big thing. So, in your experience in these studio situations, what are, the, what are some of the pitfalls that can happen in that communication? Or should I say, especially if it's, it's a scene where there's an entourage, you know, say there's a producer and a manager and the artist and all these people around, who, do you have any tricks? Who, who do you talk to? Who, how do you deal with who? It, I, again, it kind of depends, but you, you, you are kind of always navigating that and figuring out, okay, um, I can't maybe get the ear of this artist directly, but this person, he seems to trust. So let me see if I can speak to this guy. Maybe it's a tour manager, somebody he lives with every single day. You know, uh, here's a funny story. Recording Dr. John a few years ago, he had just gotten new teeth. And the new teeth didn't quite fit. And so everything that he would sing had a lisp to it. So here I am trying to record a song on Dr. John that's got a lisp to it. And I'm thinking, how do I tell? I mean, ostensibly, he's a 400-pound gorilla. He's a living legend. You can't right. go up to him and say, Mac, bro, your teeth are screwing up the scene. <laughs> but I knew that his tour manager, James, his, his valet, his personal assistant, his right-hand man, I knew this was somebody I could at least talk to and say, hey, James, how do I cross this bridge, you know, I'm, I'm having a problem with the teeth. And the, 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 the razor cut that James gave me was, man, just go tell him. He's not going to freak out about that. But until you know that, right. you don't know. You don't know if you're walking on eggshells or something like that. Now there's other, other people who that would not have gone so easily with. But Mac, it turns out, is the kind of guy you just shoot straight with him, tell him what's up. He's not taking anything personal. He's so far beyond all the ego BS Right. Well, you and you've to worked say, with Mac a lot, so he trusts been, you. Yeah, it's been yeah. more than 10 years. But even this was as late as 2006, you know, that I was having the teeth issue with him. So it was like, you know, so I'm thinking, how can I make him one of Herman, Herman Ernest, our, our friend and mentor, gave, gave me a great piece of advice with Mac. And he said that as long as you can keep him laughing, you can pretty much tell him anything. So I thought, how can I, <laughs> how can I, how can I deliver this to, to Mac with I, I said, uh, I said, Mac, uh, I think your teeth might be too big. And he's like, ah, oh, yeah, you're right. I hate these fucking things. So he pulls them out and he puts in his old teeth. And I was like, wait, wait, you had your old teeth? And he's like, this is not the first time I've had this problem. <laughs> and here I was in, in, embarrassed to go and bring it to him, but it turns out it was just nothing but a thing. He put them in, sang with them, and then he went back to the new teeth to get them, you know, situated. For the pictures, yeah. The, exactly. They sure did look nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, so... Um... Since we're talking about Mac, let's, uh, let's play a little Dr. John here. This is a, Chris engineered this record. This record won a Grammy, by the way. Life 
isn't it death experience and hell is right here on this great big earth fade on this. Um, so where did y'all record that? Uh, the bed tracks were done at Dockside in Lafayette and the strings were overdubbed at the music shed. But everything else was Dockside, horns and everything. Wardell Kazare wrote the arrangement for that one. And yeah, it's a very Wardell sound. Class, the out-of-tune yeah. horns and stuff like that. I'd, I'd, I'd uh, hear these horn playbacks and think, ah, oh, man, this is, this is out of tune. And it turns out he, wrote, he would write that dissonance into his music. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one of his little fingerprints that I mean, it just... Yeah, it's the way he voiced it, that the overtones lined up in this funky way that gave it this little kind of crunchy thing He to was it, working but... with a different skill set, for sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah, he Wardell was, was a special He guy. was something else. So, you get to do... A do like, a, most of us make records, and we have a couple days to do it. You get a, you get a Dr. John record, it's <laughs> on a major label. Describe the process of, of doing this. Like, how much time do you have? How... I probably spent more time negotiating with the record company about how much I was going to spend on tape and hard drives and my own pay than I did actually recording the session. Mac is so well prepared as far as knowing the music and the band. That was the lower 911, which was Herman Ernest, David Berard, John Fole, uh, Afro Williams on percussion, um, and then a, a couple other regulars in the horn section, Lonzo right. Bowens and, and stuff like that. Charlie Miller is always there. And so... Um, those guys, they, 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 it's like they'll, they'll write an outline and then they get up and fill in the paragraphs. Yeah. And so that outline is so well written that you don't have a lot of guesswork. It's, it's purely improv. And so it makes for a really fresh performance each time it happens. Um, but at the same time, I think if you're not used to it, it would drive you nuts because there is a lot of things that are unscripted that just happen. And you just have to be catching. You always have to be, like I was saying about fighting with the record company, they don't understand why I would need six terabytes of hard drive space. When 90% of the records they do, this is a quote, 90% of the records we do fit on 500 gigabytes. Why do you need six terabytes? Here's why. Because when those dudes are in the room, I'm recording. This is a recording studio, not a screwing around studio. So if they're in there doing something and some creative moment happens, it's not going to be my fault that this doesn't follow all the way to the end of the session. And I truly believe, I come from the school of genius is not a hat that you put on at the end of the session and say, okay, I'm going to do all my genius shit now. You, it's, it's these moments. Can I say shit? Yeah, it's okay. okay. It's, uh, we, we've done worse in okay. here before. Um, and so it's these moments John, that happen. John Goodman dropped his, his famous line. Oh, from, the good uh, man. Yeah, so he's, it's all right. Love that dude. So, uh, you know, it's, it, you, it's, it's about catching these moments. I mean, recording is a path that you make, and it's not a place you show up at. It's, it's, right. it's the journey that you're going on. And so um, you have to kind of set all your you, – you try to minimize the amount of randomness. You try to minimize the variables so that the decisions that are left to be made are purely creative ones. You make sure all your equipment's working. You make sure you're in record. You know, and, and then from there, it's just a matter of being in sync with the artist and, and trying to catch up with it. And um, So for, for Dr. John, for that record, we actually were in for three weeks at Dockside, and then we probably had another three or four days of overdubs. But Mac is old school because he and Wardell especially – Rarely would I do a session with them that was over four hours mm -hmm. because that was back in the day when unions ruled everything, 15 minutes or three hours in the studio, right. that's a wrap. It didn't matter if you were in the middle of a bar, <laughs> session's over. And so those, both of those guys are really well programmed 
um, for pacing stuff out in three hour chunks with a meal break or with right. you know ten minute breaks every fifty minutes. Or yeah, whatever. you do your ten to one session and then you eat and then you do your three to six session. That's exactly it. Exactly. And then you go to your gig. That's exactly yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> and then you do another gig. Yeah. So so with Mac, how much of what's on the record happened live in the room? I would I would say one hundred percent of it. I mean, it's he like, tracked his vocals he, live with the rhythm would, section. We would go back and, and spot the... fix things, um, but. My preference with Mac and with any artist I work with is to try to go back to an earlier take. And like, for example, I just finished the new Revivalists record, which uh, is for Wind Up. It'll be out later this year, I think. But um, that ba they really wanted to not do a cut and paste record. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to really make a live performance thing happen. And They've been playing 200 plus shows a year for the last three years, so they're very capable of performing, you know? And right. so if you need to take more than, I don't know, let's say six takes, you probably aren't well rehearsed enough to, to really be in the studio. And so with a band like that, Dave, I was able to get the majority of the performance down pat. And then if he missed a note or a line here and there, and it's just absolutely the same with Mac, you go back and you catch it from an earlier take. And that's one of the great things about Pro Tools is that I can go grab you know, this bass part from take three and put it onto take seven and we're done. And um, so Mac, that's a technique I really polished with Mac because he's not interested in revisiting stuff. He's always looking for that creative edge. He's always living there. you know. Right, There's, and he doesn't seem like the kind of guy you can say, look, we're going to hit the second bridge. Can you just sing the third and fourth word it, for me? I'm going to punch I you mean, in. You know, I've, I watched him. Marcus Miller produced a song on Mac, and I engineered it, and that was an eye-opener because Marcus had some tricks about how to get Mac to sing. He needed one line, but didn't get him to sing, he'd get him to sing this whole entire section just to take that one line. So it's like getting a running start, you know, right. and so... That fits into again, and with Mac, you never know if he's going to do something cool he over might here do anyway. Better. You exactly. Might, yeah. And uh, and so that's the other thing about Mac is that either I've constructed a performance from the live takes, or he's re-recorded the entire vocal tip to tail. Yeah. And and um, that's his preference really is to either either you have it or let me do it again, and I'll right. I'll nail it. And, and that's generally how he does. He's he has a switch that he can switch on, and Dr. John comes out. It's, yeah. it's pretty uncanny. It's, it's pretty crazy how, how cable. You call him at 11 o'clock in the morning, hello. It's like, Mac, man, I'm sorry. Are you about to die? Is everything okay? I'm just waking up, man. All right, well, I'll come pick you up. I'll be there in 30 minutes. All right, so I go scoop him up and say, hey, man, how's it going? And it's like, whoa, what happened to the dude I was just on the phone with? You know? And this is kind of the same story in the studio is that when he wants to turn it on, he's got it on tap. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to go a little techie here and, and ask you, what's your favorite microphone? Jeez, that's like saying, what's your favorite kid? Um, I could totally answer that question, but I don't think I mean, I, my, one of my kids isn't here, so I, I won't. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I would have to put more parameters on it. So like Desert Island? I, well, I have to warn you, it's, it's a little bit of a setup. I knew it. The question. What, so how, how important is gear? It's, um, it has to work. That's the biggest thing. <laughs> it, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to have to stop a session because the equipment is broken. I will eschew some awesome, I'll leave a fair child sitting on the desk if it's noisy and buzzy and not reliable. Mm -hmm. And I'll use my ART tube compressor all day long because I know every time I plug it in, it's going to sound like this. So whatever you can work out of the, the, the consistency, you know, whatever you can get to, to a point that you can rely on. Um, if I had to pick one, I don't know, I would like to say a Neumann U47, but I've also lost a lot of time on noisy and buggy and radio receptive Neumann U47s. I would like to say Neumann U67. But I've never met two U67s that sound alike. And so I would probably have to say the Coles 4038 or um, Sony C37A. I don't know. Yeah. Huh? All right. See, that's, you can Woo! tell where the real nerds are when they start cheering <laughs> for their microphones. That's, OK, good. So that sets up. Some of you have heard me tell the story that Chris told me about this next cut, but I'm going to play it first, <laughs> I think. See, the equipment has to work. Yeah, right. 
I think I just totally screwed this up. Let's try this again. I want you to take me where I belong, where hearts have been broken. So I have to ask you first off, what's the reaction when you get the phone call or email or whatever that says, hey, you're doing this Robert Plant track for this <laughs> Bats Domino record? It was uh, half, yes, I finally have gotten somebody's attention. And it was half, oh, shit, Can I, am I up to this? You know. And uh, when they told us they wanted to do two songs, then that's when I really started getting scared. And uh, I had more responsibilities on this record than just engineer or producer. I was, I was the coordinating producer. So I had to wrangle something like 30 artists. And um, uh, it was a lot, of, a lot of paperwork, a lot of details to handle uh, um, dealing with that. And so I kind of thought that the other part of it was that one of the songs that Robert wanted to do was with the Little Band of Gold. And so I knew Mike Napolitano had a real good relationship with Little Band of Gold. And I dare say that 90% of what I do every day I learned from Mike. And so it was like, well, I mean, hours and hours of deconstructing Zeppelin records in, in, the, in the studio with Mike. And he knew some of these, you know, he was a big Jimmy Page student. And Jimmy Page wrote the book on modern recording with a handful of other guys, you know. And so Nappy really knows the, the techniques that Zeppelin used and how you got that sound. That's a champ across the room with a shotgun mic. And I was like, wow, I would never have thought of that. Yeah. But that's exactly what it is when you hear it, you know? And so, um, so when they said one of the, the backing groups was going to be the, the little band of gold, I knew Mike already had a relationship with them working with CeCe Adcock and stuff. And so I, I said, we should call him. And so luckily, Mike did his song with Robert first. So I kind of got to watch the old pro handle the, the 400 pound gorilla first. And then when, when it was time for me to do mine, I already had a relationship with Robert that was working and stuff like that, you know. And uh, I'm gonna preempt your, your microphone story on that. But uh, the, the remarkable thing about that was that Robert Plant walked in and I had a Telefunken 251, which is, I mean, that's God's own microphone. And, um, I had it set up and thinking, of course, I'm going to swing for the fences. This has got to be the very best microphone on the very best singer, right? He walks in, he says, oh, do you have a, a U47? I'd much prefer that. And it was like, huh, OK. So I set up the U47. And he walks up to it, and he listens. And he says, uh, do you have a 96 millisecond slapback, maybe a tape delay? I was like, how do you know all of this crap? Like, how you're just the singer. You're just the talent. How, you're not supposed to know this. He knew exactly what his signal chain should be. He knew exactly what sound he was looking for, and it worked. I didn't have to do anything except I used a Neve preamp at 1072, set it to 40 dB again. I followed it with my old Collins compressor, and that's a wrap. It was, that's the sound right there. And so in some ways, it was kind of surreal. It didn't, it didn't connect, you know? And you'd be looking out there, and it's like, wow, that old dude kind of looks like Robert Plant, you know? And he, he kind of sounds like him, too. But then he would do, I, and you'd go, holy crap, that's Robert Plant. You know, that's when it becomes real in a moment, you know? It's like, are you kidding me? This is really happening, you know? And the week before, I recorded B.B. King. You know, that's a that's Was a that for the same record? Same record, same record. And uh, that's, I'll, all right, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, tell, I'll tell this story, but, but. Oh, please. This is a good one. This, this one got me go, in good with Sans Amp, and that's actually how, um, uh, uh, George Porter ended up getting the, the George Porter plug-in from Sans Amp, the bass plug-in. I didn't know there was a George Porter plug-in. There it is. I'm going to have to go find that. There it now. is. And so, uh, yeah, you guys familiar with Sans Amp? You know these guys? Great company. They do great stuff. They, in the early 90s, they had a club. Explain called, what they do for those okay, who are Okay, so familiar. Their, first, their, their first endeavor was to create a guitar amp simulator in a box. This is before plug-ins, before any of that. 
And so they made a pedal that had some little dip switches on it and you can kind of set a tweed sound and a Marshall stack and you can kind of voice the cabinet a little bit, but it was all in the, the confines of this little pedal. And um, that was the new thing when I started out. And so old school guys were like poo-pooing it and I was like, no, I gotta have one, you know? So I always have appreciated what they did, but they have a place. There's just yeah. one more thing. You can't rely on that only for your, for your thing. In the early 90s, they had a club in New York called Club Sands. And the idea was that they were gonna fight the noise problems of being in New York by having a club that had all virtual amplifiers. And it was like a distributed Bose system throughout the room. And you, you'd show up, there was no back line. And it was just you and your instruments. They had a Roland digital drum kit. And you'd plug into a Sans amp for the bass. And you'd plug into a Sans amp for the guitar. And that way they had 100% control over the volume of the club. And I thought it was a pretty cool idea. Musicians hated it. But I thought it was a cool idea. All, all, those, all those waves hitting us in the knees make us feel good. <laughs> it's a, some, you know, there's something to that, apparently. And so, um, so I've always appreciated these guys and come to rely on them, right? So we're doing BB we're doing King, and I go out to Vegas because he's in Vegas, and we set up at the Palms. I mean, the place was beautiful. It was like two grand a day for the studio. And so I called and gotten a Fender Twin reverb for his amp and just kind of looked up what he might like, yeah. you know? And again, my Telefunken 251 on the vocal, which was spot on for him. But um, so I had that set up and I had the amp set up and then his guys come in and they hand me Lucille. And here is Lucille. This is BB King's guitar. I mean, there's no bullshit in that. It's BB King's guitar. So I take her out of the case and I'm checking it out and just kind of savoring the moment. And I notice she's got two jacks in the, in the, the place to plug in, yeah. you know? And, um, and so I, I just plugged it in thinking, okay, this is it. And the sound was really kind of not there. It was like a, a lifted uh, ground leg or something. It just didn't sound right. So I figured maybe he knows something. There's a lot of switches. Maybe, I don't know. Women are complicated. What can I say? And so, uh, <laughs> and so I put it on the stand and kind of went at it. And then he walks in and we're talking and we, I play him the track. And he's, he's, he's cool. It was, uh, Ivan Neville and Dumpster Funk with a backing band. So I pre-recorded the track. And then uh, so he sings it down. And uh, it was actually the title track on the record, Going Home. And, uh, and so he finishes singing, and then he wants to put his guitar on afterwards. So the first pass, he is playing the hottest stuff, man. It's classic B.B. King, but the tone is crap. So it was like, oh, God, what am I going to do, you know? And so he plays through a take, and then uh, we go back and get another one, and he stops me about midway through, and he says, man, you mind coming in here? Lucille's not feeling so well. I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So I turned the playbacks down, and I left the Pro Tools running, as I'm oft want yeah. to do. And, um, and so I walk in, and, and he says, um, he said, I think I figured out what's going on here with Lucille. She doesn't like it in this hole. She likes it in this hole. And I was like, oh, well, I am so sorry. <laughs> Talk about embarrassed. And so, uh, so did he ever explain what the difference? When, yeah, he, yeah. when he plays live, he uses two amps or whatever. Yeah. In, inconsequential. So, I go back in the thing and I'm like sweating bullets at this point. Oh, geez, I just fumbled on a B.B. King session, you know, I'm thinking, oh, geez. But he was sweet and, you know, he was, he was very gracious. And so uh, I take another passes with the good guitar tone. And um, he's not really playing the hottest stuff anymore. And the first two passes were really the gold. And so he finishes up and he says, okay, you got enough? I said, yes, sir, I'll comp this together and you can go back to your cheese tray or whatever you're doing. And... Uh, so he goes back to the cheese tray. Was that train. a fat guy joke? Well, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> He loved his cheese. He, he, he specified two things. Little tiny 10-ounce Cokes and a cheese tray. Okay. Hey, BB King, easy to satisfy. And so, uh, <laughs> so he goes back and he's, you know, jaw jerking with all the, the powers that be. And I'm frantically comping. And so at some point, I made the decision to only use the hottest shit. I'm not going to mess with with anything that's poor performance, regardless of the sound. I want the best performance, and I'll deal with the sound later. So I get in there and I comp it all through, and I, I feel pretty good about all the, all the decisions I've made, and he says, okay, well, you are ready to play it for me? And I'm thinking, oh boy, here it is. So I put it up on the big speakers, and I'm about to hit the space bar for playback, and I think, you gotta do something, man. You can't just let this go like it is. 
Because 99% of what you're selling to an artist is your confidence. And if you're not confident, they're not confident. And so the other side of that is if you're too confident and they're not, they'll smell a rat and they'll call you out on it. So you, you, you have to be actually confident when you're doing this. And so, uh, so in the last moment before I hit the space bar, I decide, you know what, I'll just blast all this through a plug-in. Let me see what they have on this machine. Boom, oh, my old friend Sansamp. Click, now I'm looking at a row of knobs on this plugin, Sansamp. I'm thinking crunch, punch, bite. What, I don't know, these don't correspond to an actual amp setting. What the hell do I do? <laughs> so I'm thinking, all right, maybe there's a preset that'll get me started, something twin or something like that. I'll click, blah, 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 BB King. Are you shitting me? <laughs> so I click on the BB King preset and I hit space bar. And, and there it sounds it is. like BB that's, King. That's what you hear on the record. I didn't. I didn't change those. <laughs> see now. Now I gotta. I gotta. I'm sorry. I gotta see if I can find this track. Oh jeez. I, I think I have. It. Tell another story for a second. <laughs> Everybody's gonna go listen to this track now, and you're gonna hear the crap tone blasted through a. a Sans amp, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> going to go find it. Well, I have one more question <laughs> that I need to ask you, and then I'm going to go find well, I'll, it. Well, I'll, I'll talk about the Robert so, Plant stuff a little more, too, if you want. So what are the uh, certain qualities make for successful people in certain industries? We, you've seen a lot of engineers you've worked with. What's, what are the things that make the difference between the people who keep going in this business? Because a lot of us get started in this business and flame out. Sure. Either like don't have what it takes to make a living or realize I'd be much more comfortable if I was an accountant or whatever. And, you know, but some of us like are successful. What are the qu common qualities that you've seen amongst the successful people? First and people? foremost, love. Love, 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 love conquers all, y'all. Love. If you need one thing in this effed up universe, it's love. That's the answer to everything. So if you love what you're doing enough, it'll sustain you through the crappy rapper and gospel and blues band and... Unless you might like making rapper gospel. Well, no, no, that's what I'm saying. Is I, <laughs> I meant crappy being the operative term there. Um, so, you know, uh, if you love what you're doing, if you love microphones enough, you'll record any knucklehead who stands behind a microphone. If you love singers enough, you'll record any singer. And so if you just love it enough, it will sustain you. It'll push you through and, and get you there. Um, the second part of it is being a fan, which I think is, you know, a tight corollary to loving something. I mean, I've never met anybody. One of my, one of my great people I looked up to forever, and I ended up being able to forge a friendship with him before he passed, was Phil Ramone. And arguably the top guy in the record business of all time. I mean, there's, there's not very many things that he didn't do in the record business from Barbara Streisand to inventing the friggin' press box. The reason we don't watch the president with 55,000 microphones in front of him anymore, Phil Ramone. He was friends with John F. Kennedy. He said, this is bullshit. You should have one microphone and everybody should plug into that. And the press box was born. A simple thing, but there it is, you know. So Phil Ramone, the thing that struck me most about him, and he was the, he recorded all that Sinatra stuff too. Yeah. Uh, the thing that struck me about him was that he's a fan. He was a fan of the music. He loved the music. He loved being around musicians. Al Schmidt's another one. Just loves being around musicians and loves being there when music is being created. And for me, I love microphones. I love... I love music, and the two things together is just bliss for me. I, I, it's, I would say love conquers all, and then second to that is just being a fan of what you're doing, being happy with what you're doing. I'm not saying you're not going to be miserable, you know, but it's the, you, you hike for five miles so that you can spend time with this beautiful vista, and that's what it's about is, you know, nobody says, oh, I can't wait to hike. Everybody says, I can't wait to get to the top, and so that's, you know, that's, that's what you got to remember on those days when you're alphabetically organizing porno mags or whatever, you know. <laughs> well, we have, uh, we have a few minutes left, so I think we're going to go to some questions, and we'll, we'll listen to B.B. King when we're on the way out. I, I did have the track. I found it. So if you have questions, where, Kevin, where are the microphones? The, the mics are down here on these first landings, so please make your way to a microphone if you have a question. We're not going to bring the microphones to you. Good thing they did the lights. That was Kevin's decision. All right, here we come. Here comes some. That's it. Line up. It's just like announcements. Just ask Chris to come to your gig. That shouldn't be a <laughs> question, though. 
John, go ahead. You got there first. Hey, Chris. How's it going? Uh, what is your favorite mic to use with trumpets? Cole's 4038. I love it when the answer comes fast. <laughs> like, there's, there's no question. Hey, Jake, like, can we get one of those? Okay, that's it. Other, other, other honorable mentions would be the C37P, which uh, my C37 aficionados out there, uh, the P is the phantom-powered version not the tube version. That's just a fantastic trumpet mic. The, the, I have to give a little shout out for that Coles too. The first time I ever walked into a studio and put my trombone up and what I heard back in the headphones, I thought, oh, that sounds like me, was on one of those Coles. I don't think it actually sounded like, it sounded better than me, but I liked it, so that was. I'm sure it was the gear. Yeah. Hey, uh, yeah, sorry. I was, oh, <laughs> I just wanted to ask a um, couple of questions. What was the hardest part of your career, the, the biggest struggle you ever faced uh, as you were kind of growing? And then who was the first big musician that you ever recorded? And were you kind of like freaked out when it happened? Or like, did you have jitters or kind of um, how did it feel? You always have a little bit. You better, you better be a little bit nervous because it gives you the edge. But coming up through House of Blues, I got exposed to a lot of real heavies. And, um, and so it, it kind of took, it, it, it took some of that away. I, I got completely starstruck with Trent Reznor. I was a, I, when I was in high school and Nine Inch Nails was a tape that you passed around amongst your friends because it wasn't out on a CD yet, 1990, 91, it blew me away. I mean, I, I loved that record. And uh, then to find out that he was an engineer and he made that entire record in off time of his sessions, that blew me away doubly. So then it was always somebody I wanted to work with more and know more about. And uh, he moved to New Orleans in the late 90s. When I had my studio, he had a studio up the street. And yeah, really, just literally just up, up the street. street. And yeah. so um, uh, that kind of corresponds with the toughest time I ever had in the music business, which is about 2002. I had, I had gotten out of my own private studio, and I wasn't really doing live sound anymore. And I really became disenfranchised with the state of the, the situation. And so I started working as a repair technician. I would repair people's equipment and stuff like that. And I've always been into computers since I was a kid. And so I got a job before Apple stores existed. They had a, a, a place that specialized in Apple computers. And so I said, man, F the music business. I'm just going to go fix computers. And I went and I got Apple certified and Apple this and Apple this. And I had a head full of Apple knowledge. And I could work on any computer, anywhere, anyhow. And the next thing you know, I'm fixing people's Pro Tools systems. And I realized, man, that has a plan for me, yeah. and there's <laughs> just nothing I can escape. do to get out of it. And so that, that kind of touches on my, my most difficult time. And uh, when I was working at that store, word got around that I was the Pro Tools guru. And uh, that's how I connected with Terrence Blanchard. And, and Porter always knew me. But the frustrating thing was that they were paying this store $100 an hour, but they didn't want to pay me to go work at their house. You know? So it was like, man, yeah. what's the deal? So I realized I had some business stuff that I had to get together, too. But in this store, um, the rumor got around that you know, they have a Pro Tools guru there. And Trent Reznor walks in. And I literally was so starstruck, I couldn't move from behind. I couldn't come out from the tech shop to meet him. They were all like, literally, dude, you have to go talk to him. And I was like, <laughs> I absolutely locked up. And you know, fumbled my way through an introduction. And, and he, he was actually really gracious. And he turned out to be much kinder than he was in my mind. And um, <laughs> so I ended up going to his place and working for him a couple of times. But he and Steven Tyler were probably the two that I just Oh my God, uh, you know, but that's, that's how it goes. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, man. Dimitri. Hi, uh, I have two questions. So recently I've been getting, uh, like especially a few months ago, I got a session that was all recorded, like my friend had tracked it all at his house and he wanted me to mix it. And I feel like it's sometimes hard for me to get as engaged in a project that I haven't tracked, um, or at least had like some part of the tracking process because I don't understand like what the ideas were sure. into making the music. Um, so like do you have any advice for that type of project or like when you're only tracking some of it like overdubs or something? It can be frustrating because there's a part of us, <laughs> there's an old joke that what's the difference between God and a sound man? God doesn't think he can mix. <laughs> it's kind of true. You have to have a little bit of confidence. So whatever it takes to get that confidence and for me in that exact situation it was understanding that they wouldn't have asked me 
to do this if they didn't feel I had a contribution to make. And so you want to, you want to make that contribution. You want to add to their song. You want to help them out. You want to add to their project. And the benefit to having somebody mix it who didn't record it is that you have a fresh perspective. And so my advice would probably be to concentrate on what parts of it excite you because they may be the parts that the other guys have overlooked. They've been listening to this over and over and over again, and something that's cool to you may be de rigueur to them. They may go, oh, yeah, we've been hearing that a thousand times. And you're like, no, that's the coolest part of the song. And so I would say find the part of it that excites Think about this. We're packaging electrical impulses to trigger a neurological response. So find the electrical impulses that will trigger a neurological response within you first. And then it will, it will happen for everybody else. So find the part of it. There's something in it, I promise you. Yeah. If they went through the trouble of recording it, it's not a complete turd. So there is something in there that will be rewarding. I would, I would encourage you to go find that and hunt it down and kill it. Cool. <laughs> and then my other question, um, you've definitely recorded with a bunch of artists who I'm, you like highly respect and really get a lot of money for, like they have a lot of money to spend on the recording process. Um, and like, I, I would love to get the opportunity to do, this, do those types of projects. Like, were you ever thinking about that? Or Money is, it is just always like, second. Love is always first. Or I mean, but like, it seems like there are certain opportunities that um, only happen after a certain point. Like, you can't work with BB King. Uh, that's you know, they tell you right place, right time, and stuff like that. You have to be. It's who you know and stuff like that. But I'm a firm believer in chance favors the prepared mind. And so, if you you, it, it, I mean, you could buy your way into any situation, you know, say mom and dad are filthy rich and they can buy your way into any studio. But if you don't know what the F you're doing, you're out of there. So first and foremost, know what you're doing. Know how to do this and be able to do it in any situation, even if you're mixing some crappy band that you don't have any passion and connection to. Keep, keep working and keep working. And those, those efforts will put you into a place where the other things will happen. And I know it's, it seems like the, the weirdest advice in the world, but do not worry about the money. It will find you. If you love it first, people will, they want that. You know what I mean? Cool. Oh, yeah, All right, ask fast. Uh, <laughs> I just, how much did you know about sound in general or anything before you asked the guy in the bar to teach you how to? Hmm. I mean, I, I was an audiophile, if you could say that about a 16-year-old. Um, but I didn't have the money to buy the really good equipment. My best friend's dad was a doctor, and so he had the really pimping equipment. And so I knew, enough, I could hook up a car stereo. I knew about crossovers. I knew about uh, frequency spectrum. I was always kind of a science nerd. So I knew a fair amount, but it was remarkable how much I didn't know when I started learning. And I still don't know it all, y'all, seriously. I, there's a ton to learn. But you know, it doesn't matter how much you know, it's getting started that's doing it. You know what I mean? It's, that's, I would say just get in there and start doing it is the, the best way to learn anything, regardless of what you know f up front. Thanks. All right, one more, floor. OK, hi, thanks for coming. Um, so I have a question. I guess recently I've had sessions, or I had a session with a vocalist who, on principle, kind of refuses to do any punches, refuses to do any of like splitting takes, right? Um, and so it ended up being really taxing on him as a vocalist and on me, you know, for us doing a session for free. So I guess I'm wondering, like, how do you negotiate that between his principle and me knowing that you could get a good quality? take if you just did what I wanted to do. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to tuck that away and put it in your pocket and be like, well, you missed it, buddy. Just too bad. You just, yeah, you kind of have to, you have to, ultimately the artist has to be an artist. Like Jeff was saying, his name is on that record. And so um, if, if that's what he wants, that's what he wants. And maybe, you know, years later, he'll come back to you and say, hey, how come you didn't tell me something? If it's not appropriate to tell him, then there's nothing you can I, do. I just had a conversation mixing a record that I worked on last week, and it was a suite of tunes that happens as segues in, in live performance, but we did them in parts. Mm -hmm. And there's this one spot where the woodwind player switches from flute or from clarinet to flute. Like this tune ends, he's playing clarinet, and the next tune starts with this flute cadenza. And they sort of overlapped a little. 
And somebody in the mixing session said, oh, well, we should take the clarinet out because the flute's starting. And my line was, we're not recreating reality. We're making a good record. That's right. I mean, there is this thing of recreating reality, but we, we're not putting anything on the record that says, you know, this was all done in one take with right. no overdose. No, no, we're just making something that you want to sit and listen yeah. to, you know? Yeah. So it's important to remember what your goal is. Mm. Sorry. And okay. if, you, if so, your goal is, is satisfying the performer, well, then he wins. Yeah, there you it's go. So I'm simple. sorry we're out of time. Y'all should come ask your questions in private or yeah. come up here and hear them if you like. <laughs> one more time, Chris Finney. Thanks, guys. <laughs>